It's lucky for us that we get to hear Andrew Neumar and uh, the work that he's been conducting uh, on the recent outbreak uh, of measles, which, uh, uh, again, lucky for us, but unlucky for many of our community members, began here in Orange County. So we have some claim on uh, you know, the epicenter of, a, of an outbreak. Um, these seminar series are made possible, as I mentioned, because our faculty, friends, students, uh, collaborators uh, uh, have a network of experts who we'd like to hear uh, at, at UC Irvine who come to interact with us. So I, I encourage you, if you have somebody in mind, uh, we tend to fill the available dates a year in advance. So let us know, and we'll try to get them to uh, commit to a date. Also, um, I'd like to thank the uh, UCI Extension for helping us uh, record this seminar series. They are available on the UCI Open Courseware website and also on the UCI U YouTube channel so that those who are not able to participate in person can come uh, and uh, interact, although um, in areas. But that sometimes provokes questions and comments that we share with the rest of the community. So today's uh, presentation, as I mentioned, will be by uh, uh, Professor Andrew Neumann. He's uh, in the Department of Population Health and Disease Prevention here at UC Irvine. Uh, He's a public health demographer, and he works primarily on infectious diseases and uh, mortality uh, attributes, but also on all aspects of longevity, as well as historical and social epidemiology. He earned his PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley, and his Master of Science in Medical Demography from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the United Kingdom. Uh, Andrew works very, very well with many of our students, and uh, today's work uh, is facilitated uh, by uh, Ms. Kathleen Corey, who is sitting here in the front. Uh, she's a graduate in public health sciences major at UC Irvine, and beginning the fall, she will begin uh, graduate school at UCLA. Please help me congratulate Kathleen, and welcome uh, Andrew and Kathleen to the presentation. Thank you, Deli. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Caitlin's a full co-author on this work. Um, and uh, so I'm going to be talking mostly about measles in developing countries, but um, there is a definite connection to the ongoing simmering measles outbreak in the United States. Measles has been uh, eliminated from the United States, which means that any chains of transmission need to be initiated by uh, an introduction from a traveler from one of the several regions of the world where measles has not yet been eliminated. Um, so uh, this is going to be a talk about a model of infectious disease transmission. So I'm going to give a background um, about mathematical models in infectious disease. And, um, and then I'll be telling you about our model of measles transmission in Burundi. Um, and I'll tell you about what we learned from this exercise, um, which is really a, a type of data analysis in this case, because we have a data set on measles transmission from uh, Burundi. So it's, it's basically a, a type of statistical analysis is what we're doing here. Um, although many times a mathematical modeling in infectious disease um, is really just a hypothetical exercise as opposed to a data an analysis exercise because a lot of models um, that are out there um, really only exist in the imagination of the, of the model or there's no, there's no data uh, used to validate them, which is a, a pity because there's a lot of create, creative thinking reflected by the models, but not enough data collection. So it's especially too bad that Stefan from Johns Hopkins couldn't uh, be here with us today because he's dedicating his career to improving the quality of data collection in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but uh, I'll hope to uh, do my best to fill in for him. Um, so in, in 1911, uh, Ross, a famous parasitologist, 
um, at the London School, Ronald Ross of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the man who identified the, uh, the nature of malaria as a parasitic disease transmitted uh, by mosquitoes, um, came up with a model of, uh, of malaria transmission. And uh, this is really the, the, the first sort of modern um, infectious disease model. It's a two equation uh, ODE model, ordinary differential equation model. And remember, this is, this is uh, less than a half century after the sort of universal acceptance of the, of the germ theory of, of disease. So this was pretty um, advanced for its day. And um, the, uh, it relates to a prevalence of malaria in uh, humans and in mosquitoes and um, how the two are dependent upon each other because that's, that's basically what malaria life cycle is all about. It. The parasites, they live in the mosquito population and they live in the human population and they cycle back and forth between the two and that's, that's all that they do. There's no malaria transmission from human to human except maybe very occasionally by blood transfusion but it's basically the story of malaria is the, is the parasite cycling between humans and mosquitoes. Um, I, I won't go into full detail uh, in this model because I've got some models coming up that I'll, that I'll discuss in more detail, but this is just, this is sort of the one of several strands of, uh, from which all modern infectious disease uh, models are, are derived from. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, differential equation models, ba basically what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to come up with a mathematical formula that, that describes the dynamics of the, the disease we're studying. And uh, the task is made easier oftentimes if, if we write things in terms of rates of change as opposed to just uh, outright formulas for the, what the prevalence will be at any given point in time. So what we'd really like to have is a formula in terms of prevalence or incidence. Um, but the mathematics of doing that is, is hard, and, and it gets a little easier if you write equations in terms of the rates of change. Um, and then we can solve those equations uh, to get what we're really after, which is a formula for the prevalence. Um, so that's what this is. It's a differential equation model. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to elaborate uh, any more on that, but it, it creates basically a feedback loop which is a very similar to a lotka volterra predator prey model. Um, so uh, as you remember from when, when you took calculus, it's, it's a very, very well-worn classroom example. Uh, basically, you have uh, the, the, the classic lotka volterra model is the lynx and the hare, right? So the, the lynx is a, basically a bobcat, and the hare is a, is a rabbit, and they, they, uh, they prey on, well, the lynx preys on the hare. And so when the hare populations go, get big, the lynx do well, their populations get big. And then when their populations get big, they prey on the hare population so much so that it declines. And then when the hare population declines, there's no food for the lynx, and the lynx population declines. And you get these out of phase cycles of population sizes of hare and lynx. And that's, that's basically what these, that's basically what a lot of hare predator prey model is all about. And, so, and disease models work very much the same. Uh, the humans are, are one species and the, the parasite is the other species. And when parasites do too well, they uh, either kill their human hosts or they make them immune because of the mammalian immune system. And so the opportunities for spreading decline for the parasite when there's an epidemic and then the ep therefore the epidemic fades and the population of the parasite fades. And so you get these cycles that are very much like that of the uh, hare and the lynx. Um, in the, the basic SIR model, which is from the 1930s now, we have a, a total population consisting of n individuals. And there's a, there are subpopulations um, of people who are susceptible, infected, and recovered. And that's what these. Uh, that's what these three boxes stand for, and uh, these are called SIR models. And 
recovery uh, implies lifetime immunity, which is very similar to a number of infections, measles among them. The, you don't get measles twice. Uh, the, 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 uh, the immune memory to measles infection is very strong. And uh, so you're, you're basically, these are, every, every individual in the population is taken to be in one of these states, and there's a tra transition rate, tau, um, which goes between susceptible and infected, and a recovery rate, nu. So it looks like, it looks like this. Um, and um, that's what the, the, the box model looks like in equation form. And, and what we get is in the, in the dynamics is um, assuming a closed population size, so we have no recruitment of new, of new susceptibles once the epidemic starts. Um, basically, you, in, you, have, you start with a population that's 100% uh, susceptible, and you introduce an, an one infected individual, and what you get, a, a, in, in this case about 45 days later, is a, um, the peak of an epidemic, and then uh, the diminution of that epidemic, uh, and by the end of the model, um, most of the population is um, immune due to having recovered from the, uh, the natural infection, and everyone else um, is still susceptible, and there are no more infecteds left. So in, in this uh, instance of the model, it doesn't quite uh, have a final size equal to the uh, the total population, although you can increase the transmission parameter and, and, and simulate an epidemic where everyone gets infected. And so these, these types of models were validated by data from places like the Faroe Islands, which would go for 30 years or so without a measles epidemic, and then someone would come on a ship um, who was sick with measles, and then everyone would get infected. And, uh, uh, it was an epidemiolo a, a Danish epidemiologist called uh, uh, Panem who uh, studied this, this process. So these models do actually pretty well for um, closed populations like island populations. Um, but they're too simple for most use in, in the real world nowadays because they don't have any population growth. Uh, therefore, there's no recruitment of new susceptibles, uh, which is what happens in, in real life. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about measles now, the disease that we're modeling. Um, measles is a viral disease of humans caused by the measles virus. It's a single-stranded RNA virus in the, in the paramyxoviridae family. Uh, it's related to canine distemper virus uh, and other morbilloviruses. So we, we believe that measles came into the human population um, approximately 10,000 years ago when we domesticated wild dogs to, to create uh, our, our household pets, or, or, or at the time, probably, probably more, uh, we probably used them more for, for work than for uh, amusement. But um, in any case, when, when, when humans domesticated dogs, we got their, um, their disease. Uh, and. Um, so we don't normally think of, of measles as a zoonosis because it's not a recent zoonosis. It's a historical zoonosis but, or prehistorical zoonosis. But essentially all infectious diseases are zo zoonotic in some, in some way, shape, or form. And measles is no exception. Another morbillivirus is rinderpest, which was recently eradicated by the FAO and the OIE. Um, it was a great success story, the second uh, disease ever to be eradicated from the face of the earth. Um, not a human disease, however, as those of you in my class know, uh, a veterinary disease. Um, Metals is highly contagious. Uh, it has an R naught of greater than 16. Now, R naught is a disease that uh, R naught is a measure of uh, the inf infectiousness of a pathogen that uh, mathematical epidemiologists use. R naught is very um, poorly described often when it's described. Um, it, it is not the number of cases that an, uh, a single ca case will cause. It's the number of cases that a single case will cause uh, in a population that's 100% susceptible, which is not the same thing. So real populations are 100% susceptible because real populations are immunized through, through vaccination 
or they're immunized through um, having survived natural infection. Um, so R naught is a theoretical quantity, not not a um, not a real not an observable quantity, and R naught is uh, can change uh, from different populations to different populations. It's not a property of the virus itself; it's a property of how the virus interacts with the human population. Some human populations mix with themselves more than others. So there's no single R naught for measles, despite what many sources will tell you. There's no single R naught for measles. There's an R naught for measles in a given population in a given point in time. And even so, it's a theoretical, not an observable quantity. Um, but that being said, um, measles has a higher R naught than many other viruses and, um, and is more contagious than many other, vi than many other viruses. Um, there's a prodrome period with measles infections. That is to say that there is a period in which people who are infected with measles are, are spreading, are shedding virus before they themselves are sick. So um, there's an eruption of, uh, of a morbidiform rash. Um, there's uh, coughing and sneezing and high fever that are all signs of measles. But the day before the onset of that rash, the sick individual is shedding virus. Uh, but has none of those signs. So that's one of the reasons why measles is so easily spread, because, the, um, the, in fact, the peak of viral sh shedding occurs during the prodrome period. And so a lot of times, we don't really know who has measles, even though they're, they're spreading the virus. Um, the, the rash is sort of a blotchy red um, rash. It, it looks nothing like chicken pox. Um, even though um, most of the press uh, show a stock photo of a child with chicken pox when they run a story on measles. Um, the contact susceptible attack rate is about 75%, according to uh, studies of household contacts in Sirencester, uh, England, before the onset of uh, vaccination in that country. Um, and it is a vaccine-preventable virus. Uh, it's a vaccine-preventable disease. The current formulation is the uh, trivalent measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Um, it's a live attenuated. Uh, the measles component is, is a live attenuated um, virus. And uh, just this past week, um, rubella was declared uh, eliminated from the Western Hemisphere, the, the, the third component of the of the virus was declared eliminated from the Western Hemisphere. So we're getting some traction here, uh, despite all the um, anti-vax sentiment, which you may have heard of. Um, yeah, so it, as I said, it causes this uh, morbidiform rash, fever, cough, runny nose, conjunctivitis. Uh, it, it affects epithelial tissue. So um, the, 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 the skin is obviously highly affected by the, the rash, but um, the, uh, the, the gut is also affected, and uh, clinical, the severity of clinical outcomes uh, are, are, are highly variable. Um, hypovitaminosis A seems to exacerbate measles uh, a lot. So um, in the expanded program on immunization, when, when the measles vaccine is given, there's, there are also um, high-dose vitamin A supplementation um, as a sort of preventative measure. Um, so. The case fatality rate can be as high as 30% in malnourished populations, or, and it's about one per thousand in, the United, in countries like the United States today. Um, and global mortality has fallen um, a lot since the uh, success and, and rollout and success of the expanded program on, on immunization, uh, the WHO UNICEF joint effort to vaccinate all the world's children. So um, there are about a million measles deaths per year in the 1990s um, to approximately 100,000 uh, per year today. Um, so it's still actually a, a quite a deadly disease if you think 100,000 deaths per, per year is a lot. So um, now let me say a, f a few words about why um, us disease modelers love measles so much. Uh, there are no subclinical cases. So that's um, really nice. Um, it has a well-established incubation period at around 10 days. It has a well-established contagious period at around seven days. Um, 
natural infection imparts lifelong sterilizing immunity. So um, this is nice because that's, uh, as, as I alluded to earlier, one of the assumptions of our model is that once you're in that recovered state, you're, you're immune for life. We don't have to model the process of, of decaying immunity. And also sero surveys um, of measles antibody by age give you the CDF of infection, the cumulative uh, distribution function. So basically, um, you know, uh, you, you, can, you can look at people's blood for um, measles antibody. And that will get, tell you a lot of information about the age incidence of, of measles. If, as long as you know the ages of the, from which the blood samples were collected. And uh, mortality doesn't affect transmission dynamics. So um, a, a population undergoing a severe measles epidemic, um, the epidemic doesn't, the deaths from the epidemic don't curtail the epidemic um, because death typically occurs um, coincident with discrimination of the rash, which is after the end of the transmission period. So some people die from measles, some people, most people don't, but the deaths don't curtail transmission because they occur after the um, end of the transmission period. Um, there's a lot of interesting problems, um, only some of which I'll be able to touch upon today in the time I have. Um, but measles is just an endlessly fascinating disease. Um, the window problem is, um, is one of timing of vac measles vaccination. So um, when people are in the, in the classical case, when people are born, they have uh, antibody, uh, transplacentally acquired maternal antibody in, in their blood. Um, so when, when, when babies are born, they're not susceptible to measles. And sometime before their first birthday, usually between three months and their first birthday, they, they become susceptible because those, those maternal antibodies um, wane. Um, Though, unlike antibodies that, that we create ourselves, for which the immune system has memory and can, can make a new batch quickly, um, maternal antibodies uh, are just sort of passively circulating in the blood, and they become catabolized for protein eventually, um, and they just sort of fade away. And so there's this question of when do you vaccinate? If you vaccinate at three months, most babies uh, don't seroconvert to the vaccine because they still have maternal antibodies. If you vaccinate at 12 months, most babies do seroconvert. Um, but by then, uh, a lot of them become, have become susceptible. And so basically, the ideal age of vaccination is somewhere between 6 and 12 months in the classical case. But, we don't, um, but it, it depends from child to child. So basically, when, when do we give the first dose is a very interesting question. And then it's complicated in countries like the United States today, where most mothers are not themselves survivors of natural measles infection, but most mothers are themselves protected by th their own vaccination. So their circulating antibody levels are much lower. And so the, um, the ons onset of susceptibility of a, of a child born in a country like the USA today is a lot younger. And, um, the, uh, for, for, for babies traveling overseas, the CDC allows vaccination as young as six months, but the, um, the, 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 regular dose, the regular schedule in the United States is 12 to 18 months for the first dose. So um, the measles vaccine is safe and efficacious at six months, but it's not routinely um, done that young unless the child is going to be traveling to a place where there's where there's endemic measles. Um, then there's the question of post-honeymoon epidemics, which is something we'll be talking about a lot today in Burundi. But uh, it's basically um, time and time again, we've seen uh, epidemics in highly vaccinated populations. And uh, in, in, in some sense, what we're seeing this year is a post-honeymoon epidemic. When you introduce measles vaccination into a population, transmission goes way down and epidemics disappear, and then uh, we, in, we usually see somewhere down the road um, an epidemic occurring. Uh, we saw that in the United States in the late 1960s after we introduced um, 
measles vaccination. And we saw it again in the early 1990s. There was a huge measles outbreak in the United States. Um, the herd immunity threshold is, is, is trying to get at, at what level um, we need to vaccinate to prevent those post-honeymoon outbreaks. Um, and the question of boosting is how often do we need to, uh, to give an extra shot of measles vaccination in adulthood to keep the population immune. And then there's, then there's the question of eradication. Uh, the, uh, the eradicationists at the WHO have, uh, have a lot on their plate right now. They've got um, uh, guinea worm disease and polio targeted for eradication. But um, eventually, um, there's talk of uh, eradicating measles from the world, um, which would be you know, after uh, smallpox and polio. And uh, Rinderpest would be the fourth virus to be eradicated. Um, and there's a lot of interesting questions about sort of whether or not that's worth it and um, whether other morbidiform viruses will start to infect human populations if, if we do that. We've seen um, you know, transmission of pox viruses to humans in increasing numbers since we eradicated smallpox and discontinued um, vaccinia, vaccination. Um, there was a case report recently of, of uh, two people in Kentucky, we had the Kentucky Derby over the weekend, who, who got a pox virus from, from horses. And human pox virus in, infection is becoming more common, and the reason is that we're not vaccinating anymore against smallpox. So the question is, would, would something similar happen with other morbidiform viruses if we eradicated measles and stopped vaccinating? Um, so I'll be telling you about um, this post-honeymoon outbreak in, uh, that occurred in Burundi in the 1980s that's uh, further described in this article in the IJE. Um, and here we have um, the epidemic curve for, um, for this uh, region of Burundi, the Muyinga sector, as it's called. And the, this outbreak here. Uh, this is number of cases on the vertical axis. This outbreak here um, is the outbreak I'll be describing. Uh, th this red dashed line uh, represents the WHO sort of informal threshold for an epidemic. It's two standard deviations of the time series. So we, we, we see it's the only epidemic period during the whole time series except for this little peak here, which occurs before the onset of the EPI, the Expanded Program on Immunization. So once the EPI was introduced in 1983, uh, we, we see a diminution of uh, outbreaks. And we see no outbreak above the epidemic threshold until this one uh, in 1988-89, uh, which had uh, over 1,000 cases per month in, at its peak. Um, this is a, a vertical axis on long scale, in case you didn't notice. So, so when you're, down, when you're in, in, in this region here, you're between 10 and 100 cases per month. So, uh, so most of the typical um, caseload would be 10, 10 to 100 cases per month. Um, and we see over 1,000 during this outbreak in 1988. Um, this is uh, a scatter plot on log log scale of um, measles and chip, chicken pox incidents um, in the same region during the same time period. And we see that there's uh, very little correlation between the two. Um, and we also see that the seven uh, months, the seven most peaked months of the, uh, of the ep uh, measles epidemic do not really coincide with unusual um, chickenpox activity. B basically, this is to show that um, reporting bias is not uh, responsible for this, uh, for this peak that we see. Because in, in um, you know, data quality is always a, um, a question, and you have to ask yourself, um, are, we just, are we finding more measles here because we're looking for it more? And the answer is, well, we're not finding more of other diseases. Um, so here's our model that I'm going to tell you about. It's, uh, uh, basically, it's, it's a more nuanced version of the SIR model. Um, we have uh, five classes. The first one is M for maternal antibody protected. So that's for the reasons I, I spoke of a few minutes ago. Uh, when you're born at birth rate B, you're born into a, 
a class of people who are protected by maternal antibodies. You, de you decay from that class with, with rate uh, uh, delta into susceptibility. You decay from susceptibility with um, force of infection lambda uh, into uh, a latent class where you are um, infected with measles but not um, contagious to others. And in order to get the trans transmission dynamics right, you need to model the latent and contagious separately because the, those people in the latent class introduce a delay. They, they introduce like a shock absorber into the dynamics of the transmission because you have all these people who are becoming infected and they can't become infected again because they're already infected. But th they're not transmitting yet. Then you pass from this shock absorber state into the contagious state, C. And from contagious, you uh, pass with rate nu into uh, this absorbing state, uh, Z, which is uh, immune. And vaccination is modeled as, as a process whereby people are transported um, from susceptible to immune without passing go and without collecting measles. Um, so uh, here's our model in equation form. It's a five equation PDE in age and time. So partial differential equation is, as I know all of you remember from, from your freshman calculus. Um, so this isn't as, um, as bad as it looks. It basically has a, uh, just a few simple components. First of, all, I, first of all, there's a background mortality rate mu which occurs, it's, it's age dependent, but it's class independent, and I've, it's, I've boxed it here. It's just so, so every equation has, every equation has uh, mortality uh, with, with a minus sign associated with it somehow. Um, and so people are dying at some background rate. And then we have um, a series of terms that relate to people passing in between different states of the model. So you're, you're born it and you're protected by maternal antibody, and, uh, but you decay from that state uh, at rate, de at rate uh, delta, and, you see, uh, and it's decay because there's this minus sign associated with it. And basically, if you leave one state, you have to enter another state. So if you leave maternal antibody, you, you enter the susceptible state. So this term, the fact that these two terms look alike is not a coincidence. Like that ha that's a structural component of the model. Um, and basically, um, we have uh, an age zeta at which people uh, just all move from maternal antibody to uh, susceptible. And so the, the delta there is a Dirac function. Okay. And it's the same thing with uh, the force of transmission. The force of transmission removes people, there's the minus sign, removes people from susceptible and moves them into a latency. And so again, this term cascades from the second line of the equation to the third line of the equation. So all of the terms, I, know, I, I realize this looks like there's like a million terms here, but all these terms have a really simple purpose. The, there's mortality, which occurs in all classes, and then there's these terms which cascade down the model which are responsible for moving people from one state to another. And so what this is is just it's these five equations that describe the rates over time and age at which people move among these five classes. Um, there's the rate of contagious decay, and then there's the rate of recovery nu. Um, so that's... Um, that's sort of a, some more detailed description. Um, now let me um, say a little bit about um, lambda, the force of, trans force, of, uh, force of infection. So in our model, the force of infection is, t is time dependent but not age dependent. Uh, we're, we're assuming that everyone in this population mixes with everyone else um, evenly, which is a pretty good assumption for Sub-Saharan Africa, or, or at least models that make this assumption seem to validate the data well. Um, 
In, in other countries, it may not work so well. Um, and basically, there's this, um, there's this parameter, key parameter beta, um, which is set. It's a fixed parameter. Uh, and beta times the proportion of the population that's contagious gives you the force of transmission. So if 10% of the population is, is infected, then 0.1 beta is going to be the force of transmission at that moment in time. And we derive the value of beta from the equilibrium pre-vaccination stable equilibrium of the median age uh, of infection pre-vaccination. So basically using sero surveys, we know what is the median age of infection in the, in the unvaccinated population because vaccination didn't come into sub-Saharan Africa until the 1980s. And so we know, you know, left to its own devices, how much does this population mix with itself such that it produces measles transmission dynamics. And uh, we assume a constant force of infection, which gives an exponential decay of the susceptible population, as you remember from calculus. And so the exponential um, PDF uh, shape parameter is the reciprocal of the mean age of infection. We adjust for the age of maternal antibody and we get an estimate of the force of infection in the pre-vaccination population, and then we run the model until it reaches an equilibrium and back out the value for beta. Then we use that beta henceforth as a measure of how much the population mixes with itself. And we run the model again with beta fixed and the force of infection free to move over time. Um, all of these models uh, descend from uh, this model published in 1974 by Frank Hoppenstadt. Um, we're improving upon previous work by using realistic demography. So we have, a, we have a life table that we've estimated from Burundi, um, and we, we, which looks like that. A male life expectancy of 43, a female life expectancy of 46. And this is sort of the cohort decay of the population from birth. This is a pretty severe life table by today's standards, but um, life was hard in rural Burundi in 1980s. Life is still hard in rural Burundi today, for that matter. Um, we solve the system of equations numerically, so, so we don't have to do the math. We just have to program the computer, and the computer gives us the answer. The uh, models like this don't have um, analytical solutions in any case. Uh, we use IDL to do all the work, which is a, uh, a bit like MATLAB, if you're familiar with that. So um, when we program the computer, this is the, these are the results it get, gives us. We get measles epidemics, uh, just like in the real data. Uh, one of the nice things about um, one of the nice things about uh, doing PDEs by age and time is that you get results that are explicit uh, by age. So you can, you can tell not only that the incidence of measles is increasing over time, but that the mean age goes up and the st uh, standard deviation of, of age goes up. So the distribution becomes wider. As we introduce vaccination, more and more people become infected at different ages. Um, this has profound implications for, the, for rubella, which was just eliminated from the Western Hemisphere. Um, when you introduce vaccination pro programs for rubella, much the same happens as when you introduce vaccination programs for measles. And in fact, the same vaccine is used for both nowadays. That the mean age and standard deviation of age of those who are infected goes up after you introduce um, uh, vaccination because even though you're averting cases, you're also perturbing the, the dynamical system that is the disease transmission. And so you're changing things. And what you're doing is you're getting fewer cases, but older cases. And um, for measles, it doesn't really matter whether you get sick at age two or age four, or age 14, really. But um, for rubella, uh, if you're a pregnant woman, you want to avoid 
uh, uh, rubella infection at all costs because it causes congenital rubella syndrome. So one of the things we've done is we've created this problem by pushing the age of rubella infection up. Um, we're, we're ex we've exacerbated the congenital rubella syndrome um, problem. And so the solution there is to either not vaccinate for rubella or to, to do it well and make sure that you eliminate rubella. But sort of doing it halfway is not a good idea. Um, so this is um, really where the, uh, the partial differential equation approach comes into its own, where you can really visualize this is a what a demographer would call a Lexus surface. It's, it's, a, it's a wireframe representation of the inc incidence of, uh, of measles per month um, over time and age. So this is like that in incidence curve that I showed you in the empirical data. So it's monthly incidence of measles, um, except it's now not only by time, but by age. And you can see that, um, that uh, first of all, you can see, nope, this is the first six months of life here. So nobody gets sick with measles there. And then the rates of infection go up rapidly after that. And during the, the epidemics, we get these ribs occurring, right? So the, these ribs represent, that during the epidemics, the mean age of infection gets, gets older. And, and what you have here that the basic SIR model doesn't have is you have accumulation of susceptibles um, through population growth. And as, and as the epidemics become further and further apart, those susceptibles become older and older through cohort aging. And so when you get an epidemic, this is the, the first big post-honeymoon epidemic, you get, you get uh, people being infected at much older ages than the previous epidemics. And you see this little trough here. This is a cohort of individuals who survived the previous epidemic and therefore are immune. Um, so you, over time, you get very complex um, dynamics of uh, measles uh, incidence um, over, over time. Um, so if we vary the immunization rate, this, so we're now doing some counterfactuals here. If you vary the immunization rate, you get different dynamics. So um, the, this green curve here is when you have 65% of the population immunized against measles. Now, when I say Im Im immunized, I mean true immunization. So I mean um, the vaccination times vaccine effectiveness. So the measles vaccine is, is a little bit over 95% effective in a population like the US where we have good supply chain. Uh, it's less effective typically in Sub-Saharan Africa where um, it's harder to keep the vaccine cold. The vaccine needs to be cold. If the vaccine gets heated to room temperature, it, it loses its efficacy. So it needs to be transported from health post to health post in, in ice, on ice. And the destination health, health post typically doesn't have uh, mains electricity in rural regions. So um, there has to be not only ice, but enough ice to keep it cold continuously from the factory till the, the morning that it's injected into the arm of the child. And so 65% um, so um, immunization could be, you know, 100% vaccination rate with, with a significant cold chain interruption or something. And we, we see with 65% vaccination that we get this dip uh, in, in incidence from 1,000 cases a month to, uh, to under 10 cases a month, but that, but that the epidemics come back. With higher immunization rates, we see a lower dip, a longer time to the first post-honeymoon epidemic, and a longer period in between epidemics. And with 85% um, immunization, we see effectively that we uh, can reduce incidence to zero. That's 10 to the minus 7. But what happens is, in, in the model, there's still a fractional number of people with measles, and you get the return of uh, an epidemic. In, in, um, in real life, what you have is just accumulation of enough susceptibles that, such that introduction of, of, a, of, a, of a virus from another district gives you an epidemic. But in any case, even 
immunization rate is not enough to suppress measles forever. 95% seems to be. Um, and um, rural Africa is, a, is one of the last regions of the, of the world that still has a pretty high population growth rate. And so we looked at how this herd immunity threshold varies by um, population growth rate. And so um, here we have a somewhat unconventional uh, measure of herd immunity, but it's, it's measured in waiting times between epidemics. And so here in the dark blue, we were talking about waiting times of about 25 years between epidemics. That's effectively, you know, we've effectively interrupted transmission at that level. And here in the, in the red is, is five years or less waiting time between epidemics, um, which means that basically if you just wait a few years, you're gonna get another epidemic. You have not achieved uh, herd immunity. And uh, when Caitlin and I made this graph, of course we were hoping for some like really sort of rugged landscape that would look kind of, you know, like the surface of the moon or something that would, would, that would show that you have to be very careful about, you know, choosing, you know, your, your vaccination rate or something relative to population growth rate. But of course, um, not surprisingly, we, we get really just a smooth transition. Um, uh, populations that are growing faster, um, somewhat counterintuitively have a lower threshold uh, of, uh, of herd immunity. Populations that are uh, growing slower, you have to va vaccinate more. The reason for this is the maternal cases. So when you have a high birth rate, you have a higher proportion of your population that's between zero and six months. Those are all uh, protected. And so you don't have to vaccinate as much of the population because uh, more of your population is, uh, is uh, immune. Of course, in the long run, you, you do have to get all those people or else they will accumulate and you will get epidemics, but um, there's this slight gradient, you know, higher, higher growing populations have a lower uh, immunization, herd, herd immunization threshold, but there's a smooth transition between the region of, uh, of herd immunity and, um, and outbreaks, and, it, and it's between 80 to 90% of the population needs to be immunized. Now, that's immunized, that's not vaccinated, that's immunized, and even in the US we see primary and secondary vaccine failure. Primary vaccine failure is where you get the shot but you don't uh, seroconvert, you don't produce antibodies. Either the shot got warm before you got it or in, um, in some rare cases you just aren't adapted to producing antibodies for the vaccine strain. Um, and then secondary um, vaccine failure is essentially failure to boost. It wears off and um, you, you, typically we give another shot. Um, so tip, the, the, the recommended dosage is two shots as a child and then a, a, a third around age 18 when you go off to college. And then maybe even one as sometime in adulthood. Um, so uh, uh, herd immunity thresholds um, actually de decrease all things being equal with increased population growth. Uh, that's kind of a counterintuitive finding, but um, it's, it's because of that pesky maternal um, antibody class. Um, and even with 85% you know, effective immunization, uh, there are enough measles susceptibles who can accumulate to cause epidemics. And so um, you know, measles is very unforgiving in terms of, um, in terms of uh, it's epidemiology, we really need to get, you know, at least 85% of, or preferably in the 90% of people immunized. Um, so we need virtually 100% vaccination since there will always be a few vaccine failures. And um, so models can be used to um, improve vaccine program design around the world. I, I didn't show a, a table, but the breakdown in our model of measles incidence by age um, equals the, uh, the observed uh, breakdown in Muyinga sector in the, in the late 1980s. Um, you know, not exactly, obviously, but, but to first order approximation. And the, the overall um, infectious, uh, this, the overall time series of um, the infectious curve 
uh, equals d observed one um, to first order. So, I mean, this model is a pretty good fit to what was going on in Burundi in the in the um, 1980s, and uh, and so you know we we know basically that it's it's pretty predictive that we're going to need to have 85 percent or more immunization to to, to suppress um, outbreaks, um, and, in, and in including age really um, makes the model. I think just not only better in terms of the dynamics, but really more useful in terms of things like um, conge congenital rubella syndrome, and also knowing at which ages to do catch-up vaccine programs. One of the early mistakes of uh, the EPI was they would, they would do these catch-up programs where they would try to fill in the cracks of, of people who were missed in, in um, the expanded program on immunization, and they would just go in and re basically revaccinate or vaccinate, try to, try to make sure that every child had at least one shot. But you need to pitch those catch-up programs older because it's the, old, it's, the, it's the accumulation of susceptibles at older ages that cause these post-honeymoon outbreaks. You need to be vaccinating 10-year-olds and, and eight and nine-year-olds, not just really small kid, infants and toddlers if you wanna uh, prevent measles outbreaks in, in developing countries. And, and in, the, in the US context, you need to be vaccinating, making sure that everyone gets their booster before, uh, before they go off to college. And so I'm really glad that the UC is taking a, a pretty hard line on this. Um, um, so that's, that's all um, I have to say. I, I think I'm, I'm just about up anyway. Um, I guess we have time for a few questions. I'd like to thank Felicity Cutts from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And, um, and Nigel Gay uh, from the England and Wales uh, Public Health Lab uh, Laboratory Service, as it was called uh, at the time he was collaborating with me, and uh, Bob Chen um, of the CDC for, for the data that we used. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions. I have one. So the assumption for herd immunity so let's say the five percent is evenly distributed. What if it's patchy as we were hearing in the recent US case where in some communities it's much lower than that, or other times close to hundred percent? How does the model accommodate this kind of patchy distribution and what is the higher? Right. Well, so the model's not geographically or, or spatially explicit in any way. Uh, it assumes a, a sort of homogeneous popu population in, in a single polity, if you, if you will. Um, there, there are some models which have uh, two or more compartments which are coupled to each other so that the, um, in the most basic form that the force of transmission is, is an average of um, all four compartments, say, and then um, and then you, um, basically, but I mean, what, what you theoretically expect to happen is, is more or less what we, what we do see happen, which is that, you know, Marin County, if, if, if you will, or Orange County, for that matter, um, you know, gets more measles out, uh, measles cases. I mean, is it the cases cluster where there's no vaccination, essentially? Um, in, in fact, um, Maya Majumder uh, and co-authors had a, uh, a research comment um, in one of the journals in the, in the last few months, uh, basically showing that, that that's what you, that you see. Um, I mean, the, the virus tends to go, viruses tend to go where you push them. So the, the reason why we have so much flu virus ev evolution every, every year is because we're vaccinating 120 million doses of, of flu vaccine every winter. So. The, the virus is sort of running away from the vaccine strain, and then we have to get a new strain the, the next year, and then it continues and continues. With measles, we don't see viral evolution. Like, there's this, this, the measles vaccine strain has been the same for 30 years, but uh, thank, thank goodness. But, um, but what you see spatial, it, the measles virus runs spatially where, uh, where you push it. So you're, we're essentially pushing it into communities where um, where, the, where there's high vaccine refusal. I mean, most of the cases um, are un among unvaccinated kids. So it's not hard to figure out what's going on here. 
they, they weren't vaccinated, they're susceptible, they get sick. Um, there, there, are, there are some documented cases among vaccinated kids, and this is either primary or secondary vaccine failure. In, in most cases, it's hard to distinguish between primary and secondary vaccine failure, but it, in any case, it's vaccine failure of some, of some variety. Um, it's the vaccine failure that's really heartbreaking because these are people who made a good faith effort usually to, to get vaccinated, and it's, it's because of um, the non-vaccination of people around them, on average, that is the reason why they're being exposed to measles. Um, herd, herd immunity means you don't need 100% immunity, even though with measles it's, it's a relatively high threshold. You can still be a, a sort of free rider um, on other people's vaccination and, and be safe. And this is important for um, people who, who, for example, can't be vaccinated uh, for medical reasons, um, which is a relatively small number, but those people can be effectively protected if other people do their part. I'll ask my second question. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, this virus evolved from the canine distemper virus. Are dogs still susceptible to the measles that affects humans now? Do you know? Uh, uh, they have their own form that's diverged over. Well, uh, I mean, dogs, dogs are susceptible to distemper. Um, I, I don't think they're susceptible to human measles per se. And, and humans aren't susceptible to canine distemper per se. But, um, the, you know, the pox viruses, there are cases of, uh, are, are classic examples of, uh, of, of, of sort of very liberal uh, cross-species transmission. So there are documented cases of human gerbil pox, human monkey pox, um, the, um, the recent cases were humans who got a pox virus from horses. It's a bit ambiguous as to whether or not that's horse pox, which was thought to be extinct, um, but, or some other pox virus. But um, you know, the, the, the pox viruses, which, which is a different family of viruses, um, are examples of, of sort of very, very liberal in, um, interspecific um, transmission. But, um, with, with measles and distemper, um, they're, they're not uh, closely enough related, but um, there, there are other uh, morbilla viruses out there that you know, could potentially cause problems. If, um, that, you know, nowadays, we don't see them because we all have measles vaccine. And then in the old days before measles vaccine, I mean, who, who knows? I mean, it, uh, it, it could have been misdiagnosed as measles. So. Okay, in the absence of any, we actually will continue discussing this right. over at the lunch. You're invite, yep. invited at the anti instructional research building. I'm pretty sure Andrew doesn't have this version of our mod. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you again for the presentation and uh, thank you for your work. And uh, hopefully you will carry this work with you uh, this day and tell them all about it. Thank you. Thank you.